Hi, Ken Adams. Hey, I see. I'm gonna put you. I'm gonna publish you, so you're gonna be in the main box. So all right, it, the main box. Yeah, so this is an interesting, very confusing little deal. It, it it's a different platform. So you've got your slides handy for those of you joining us. Um, oh, um, do I? Am I gonna be able to pull them up? I, I told you, you need to. You, you can't. You're gonna need to be able to see them. I'm. They're on the screen. Well, that's not true. So for those of you joining us in the blue line above, um, you know, in, in the header, you can yeah. click on overcoming enmeshment and follow mm -hmm. along on the slides. And now they have enhanced it so you can actually also oh, I see. download them. But Ken, you will want to have a version on a different tablet or something like that so that you can follow along. You know this material cold, but anyway. Yeah, well, I can just put you in two windows too, right? Um, I don't know. You, if you if you are able to do that, I've got two screens, so I flip it up onto the other screen. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not going to be able to do that exactly. Let me see if I can do this. So they're going to be able to follow along, correct? If they If they click on the link... Because they're going to see you. You will be in the box as soon as I hit publish. You're going to be in the big box um, uh, mm -hmm. on this screen. And then I have your slides on a and separate who will I be, spot. Who will I be seeing? I think me in the little box, but just you. All right. Well, all right. That, that, I think I can pull this off. I am confident two. you can pull this off. For those of you joining <laughs> the, us, he's a an amazing presenter. I've known him for mm, nearly, I don't know, 14, 15 years. Oh, so probably, you're actually almost talking to years. a live audience right yes, now. Yes, yeah. there's audiences down below. So, um, oh, so yes, people okay. have joined us. We will all record right. this. So we're going to start in about 10 minutes. And uh, Dr. Ken Adams will be presenting on overcoming <laughs> enmeshment. I've shared um, uh, with, I've shared before, including in September, that your um, podcast with Dr. Rob is mm -hmm. our number one podcast that, that has been downloaded. Um, you know, the, the podcast series has had over half a million downloads, but yours still with um, uh, the enmeshment topic is the it has continued to be the top downloaded um, uh, podcast. So it's a very timely and useful topic. And I'm sure that the group will um, be grateful to have this. Will they be able to, um, or there'll be a question and answer period. Will I hear from them? So I, I will, they, so thank you for asking that. So for those of you joining, um, if you have questions, you're going to IM them to me, and then um, I will ask them of Dr. Adams. And uh, so if you're joining uh, with this meeting format, uh, can people can request to share. And this, for those of you joining, that that, that isn't going to happen today. So if you try to go in from the request to share. I'm going to X you out. It's not personal, um, but I'm going to, to uh, remove you from that. So any questions that you want to have asked, <clears throat> you, you would IM them to me and I will then ask them of Dr. Adams. So, so that's how it works. So you're going to I present. See, I see. Okay. So we have a recovering audience. Yes. Correct? Yes. This is, and, and I believe, you know, partners and loved ones of, of recovering people too. I know, you know, we've had um, betrayed partners and things in the groups before because they've reached out to me afterwards. So, um, and, so and yes. not just necessarily sex addiction, other addictions. Absolutely. Well. The In the Rooms platform was created um, like 11 years ago and has, I mean, like the reason we have an hour in between these sessions is the largest of the AA and I think NA meetings are on Saturdays and these frame around those. So, I so see. we have this for Very one cool. hour, but, but they, they've had, you know, a worldwide audience for, for years and then COVID hit and everything, you know, has just really blossomed. So it's, you know, they were ahead with the technology and offering online meetings. There are, it's a fantastic resource. I mean, Sophia Cottle, who's going to be doing um, the later mm -hmm. uh, presentation, um, she has grief, she has two grief groups that she runs, but I mean, there's, there are, you know, 
Uh, there's a chem sex group. And David, Dr. David Fawcett is running that one on Tuesdays. Um, that's a unique thing where it's both co-occurring. So there's just a ton of resources on here, trauma groups. So very, very cool. all free. Yeah, yeah. It's all free, um, you know, 12-step oriented. So all approved. They all have, um, uh, you know, uh, approval by the general um, offices for mm -hmm. the various organizations. So, yeah. Hmm. And Rob has been doing the, Dr. Rob Weiss has been doing the Friday night group at 6 p.m. Pacific time for about four years. And he's got, um, it, it has varied, but during COVID, it's been between 200 and 280 people a night, you know, on, in this group. Wow. So, so it's good go, stuff. While, while we're waiting, I'm going to go get my power cord just to be safe. Be right back. Get, get your power cord. For those of you joining us, we're going to start in about six minutes. And Dr. Ken Adams, who does, um, well, I should see if I've got his book. I've got everybody's books handy because I have lots of books. I'll see if I can find his really quickly. Um, uh -uh. Well, he's probably got a copy of it handy. Oh, there it is. I knew I had it. So, so Dr. Ken, I've got silently yes. seduced. I'm holding up for the group. So, you what? I've got your silently seduced book. I'm holding it up. Oh, okay. I, I think I have a couple. I have a a slide that has both the books Good. on it. So, I've got them. Right. I've got the slides handy too. So, so you got your power cord. You're all. I'm rolling. All plugged yeah. in. Yeah, so, we've got we've I'm got about five plugged. more minutes, but I'm gonna I'm gonna hit publish. You're gonna. And go to the big box. There you are. There I am. Yeah. It's like, old, it's like old times, except not in person, Tammy. Exactly. So. And with a different organization. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I so heard you, from somebody who was joining your. Um, I know you did a presentation yesterday, and uh, the therapist. Training. Yeah, the therapist yeah. was. Um, uh, on lunch break, reached out to me about a client um, that could use help from Seeking Integrity, uh, Los Angeles Treatment Program, and, but she said you were doing a great job. And I was like, that doesn't surprise me, so. Well, thank you. Yeah, we had uh, 50 therapists and I have 50 more in January. And so I'm, I'm training them. Well, I'm, I'm walking them through the best practices in treating um, an adult to mesh with a parent. Oh, fantastic. Because I have stopped referring to therapists because they've been going down the wrong path after I've gotten some of these men and women emancipated. And so I've had to hit the brakes and say, I don't have a referral for you. So I have, I had eight um, touchstone moments of best practices. Every, every piece of the puzzle, I walked through a half a dozen bullet points about what I thought was best practices. So the workshop gives at least a, a basic foundation to the therapist. So they at least know, what the strategies are. That's so I think fantastic. Please, yeah, are, so, are, are they going to be listed on your website? Like those yeah, so on the website, okay. uh, by next week, I should have up find a therapist. Good. And um, I'm not endorsing any of the therapists. I'm just letting right. them. And so what the um, visitor will be able to do is go on there and put their state, their address in and the state will come up as to which, how many therapists in their state have gone through this training. So at least they know that that therapist has the basic information. Oh, that's fantastic because it has been, I, I mean, I obviously, as I mentioned, your podcast <laughs> on sex, love and addiction is the top podcast when the series has had over a half a million downloads. It's, it's been very popular, but then <laughs> people are reaching out and they're going, how do I find help for this? And I refer them to your overcoming enmeshment uh, website, which is helpful, but they're still going, how do I get help? And right. to your point, there are too many therapists who not only aren't helpful, but can really um, make things more problematic if they go down a certain path. So, so it will be really helpful for them to mm -hmm. um, have some possible good resources, <laughs> trained resources to, to reach out to. So, 
Yep. So It'll for those of you joining us, overcoming enmeshment is um, is uh, that's where they they will be listed, right? It, it'll be on the website overcomingenmeshment dot com, and mm -hmm. it'll be under the uh, heading "Find a Therapist." Great. So for those of you joining us, this will be recorded in, um, we're gonna start in about another minute, but if you look in the blue band above um, in the header section, it says overcoming enmeshment. Those are the PowerPoints. You can download them and in the rooms has gone to the extra level where you can actually hit print and print them too. So you can download them uh, or print them if you'd like to do so. But it does have the link that Dr. Ken Adams was mentioning, the overcoming enmeshment that and his contact information is right on those slides as well. But you can follow along. That's what he'll be presenting from. Um, for those of you that are joining us for the first time um, on this platform uh, for, for this, um, welcome. Um, how this works is very different than the typical meetings for in the rooms where you can request to share. So if you try to request to share, I'm going to, with all due respect, just hit X and X you out. So it isn't you. Any questions that you have, if you um, IM them to me, um, then when Dr. Adams is done with the presentation, which will be about 40 minutes, you know, then he'll be able to answer your questions. He, he isn't your therapist, so, he, so you know, he will answer in a more general way. He can't specifically talk to your specific situation, right. but, you know, there will be um, very good information. And as we were mentioning on overcomingenmeshment.com, um, you'll be able to find some resources, but including he will be adding within a week or so therapists that may be able to work with you in your area for that. So, Tammy, one so, quick question. Sure. I'm sorry. Uh, so remind me again. So they, they have access to the PowerPoints, but they aren't necessarily viewing them. It, it Yeah, correct. So someone who's like watching this on their phone is probably, I mean, they may download them and not watch you. So, so you have choices. If you're joining us, you can either okay. watch Dr. Adams or follow along the slides, or if you download them and save them, you can look at the slides later. I okay. have the luxury of being in my, my office. I have my computer, I've got my screen, so I've got both going, um, but not everybody w you know, will be viewing it that way. So we understand that, but the, the slides are available. I don't know, I, ha I haven't checked. Ideally, all the slides are available th with the videos afterwards on the link on In the Rooms. Um, I'll check with um, the In the Rooms guys about that because that would be a valuable resource you know, for okay. anybody because we, you know, the, the videos are, are there. I've sent a number of people the links so that they can watch or rewatch uh, the information. So, so I think we're going to get started. Um, I want to welcome you. The, the In the Rooms uh, platform has been around for around 11 years and it's a, a resource for those of us in recovery. Um, I've been a member longer and then this uh, this came up. I'm, I work with Dr. Rob Weiss at Seeking Integrity. Um, we've collaborated. Dr. Rob wanted, we know lots of people and, and normally these people such as Dr. Ken Adams present just to professionals and this is an opportunity uh, for them to share their information with those of us in recovery. Um, there's so many great things that we can learn that we probably want. We just, we just don't have the access to it. So, so I'm really pleased um, that Dr. Ken Adams, who I've known for years and years is a dear friend, but his work with overcoming enmeshment, um, you know, really unpacking the, the problematic relationships and how to free yourself from them is, you know, is a game changer. And I hear so many people, partners or the addicts that are struggling with this. So I think you'll, you'll really appreciate it. So I'm going to toggle off my audio. I'm going to let Dr. Adams present and then at about 40 minutes or so, whenever he's completed with his slides, it, the, I see some questions coming in on my IM. I will ask him those questions. So, um, but we're really glad you're here. Thanks. Thank you. Nice to be here and, and welcome everybody. And so uh, you're there if I need you, if something happens here that, okay. Well, nice to be with all of you. Um, I'm going to assume that you're not looking at the PowerPoints, which is just fine because I was, <clears throat> I had uh, put too many in <laughs> because I wasn't sure uh, the range of uh, different kind of issues that people would be dealing with in this topic. So I try to cover as much many bases as I could. So I'm just going to use them as talking points. So um, 
let, let me tell you a little bit about, before I get into the definition of enmeshment and how it relates to addiction uh, recovery and couples and partner recovery, uh, if you're a partner recovering uh, with an addict and you have felt betrayed or, or impacted by their addiction. <clears throat> um, years ago in my own personal recovery, of course, uh, many of you may already know this, um, it, once once the addiction is arrested, the, the the tough work comes in looking at the underlying issues. And uh, Bill Wilson said in one of his writings that humility was the ability to become who we are rather than who we think we should be. And what he was really saying from my clinical perspective <clears throat> was that he was saying it's time to grow up, drop the false self and become your authentic self, which is a difficult journey especially for those of us who have been invested in roles, role identities that come out, come out of our families. So um, I, I discovered the issue of a measurement uh, clinically uh, when I was in graduate school still, and I was working at um, a clinic for adult children of alcoholic parents. And I noticed a lot of the uh, adult children had these intertwined relationships with their families. In other words, they were, they were much too close. Uh, their entanglement was causing them inappropriate guilt. They were bonded to their families out of inappropriate loyalty. Their spouses, their careers, uh, their partners, their children, um, and to some extent their recovery all came down the list and their parents and their family got top top dog on their list. And I thought there's something wrong with that. And then I began to notice that relapse for, at that time I was looking at sex addicts, that those who had these entangled relationships with their parents and their families often would relapse after a visit home. So I wrote my first professional article on, over, on, on enmeshment um, back in 1987. I followed that up with a book called Silently Seduced when parents make their children partners. And then I followed that up um, with Winnie's Married to Mom, where uh, helping mother and mesh men overcome, um, um, open their hearts to true love and commitment. Um, so I've been studying and looking at this phenomena, both professionally and personally, since the uh, mid to late 80s. Um, more recently, um, I have been, so, so let me, let me say this to you. So let's, let's start with the obvious question. Can there be too much closeness between family members? The short answer is absolutely yes. Especially when that closeness is designed to feed the needs of the parents at a cost to your own independence and emancipation. So that's problematic, and that's the that's the lynch point in defining why being too close is problematic, right? The as a parent myself, um, the parent's job is to let go, not to hang on. The family's job is to celebrate independence and to honor separateness. It is not to create guilty loyalty binds in which the adult child feels like they can't get on with their life because they're obligated to take care of their mother who's lonely because of her bad marriage. So uh, so the truth of the matter is, yes, indeed, there can be too much closeness. And oftentimes these mesh families have a certain warmth to them. You know, I grew up, my mother was Hungarian and I, I love the warmth in my Hungarian part of the family, but boy, could they get entangled. <laughs> and you, you their problems became your problems. And then my aunt's problems and my mother's problems and my grandmother's problems and everybody's problems all of a sudden became my problem. <laughs> and I said, how did this happen? It's because the, the, the boundaries in these MS systems are permeable. There's nobody knows where somebody ends and somebody else begins. So I'm gonna kind of walk you through some clarity about that atmosphere, how it impacts addiction, how addictions can grow out of that environment <clears throat> I'll talk about the impact of the meshed uh, man or woman. I'll probably focus mostly on men, and I'll tell you why in a minute. And its impact on his partner. And then if there's time, we'll do a little short experiential exercise, kind of a workbook exercise. So grab a pencil and a pen if you can. Um, so the other thing that's happened more recently 
in my journey of, of, of uh, looking at this is I began a series of workshops for men and women uh, about seven years ago. And I have, uh, and the, the workshops are designed for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to emancipate the man or the woman out of their family of origin, to divorce contractual arrangements with the family that I should somehow be obligated to you out of guilt and loyalty, so that I can then maybe come around and love you out of choice, but not out of guilt. Therefore, I can both get on with my life and still love you. So that's a very difficult shuttle to do if you're burdened with excessive guilt and loyalty. So I began these workshops and um, uh, over the last seven years, I've had 450 men and women, mostly men, and I'll get to that why I think it's men and not women in a minute, uh, who have come from all around the world, uh, Middle East, uh, Australia, South Africa, Russia, Cuba, uh, from cultures where closeness and enmeshment seems to be normative, right? And if we have time, I'll try to get to where is the line between caring and enmeshment and, and my cultural norms and enmeshment. And one of the things that I, I also have done since then, I've begun to put together some uh, YouTube videos. I have a YouTube channel now, Dr. Ken Adams. And within one year, one year, um, the, the video I did, I had a number of them, but the video I did, what is enmeshment and are you enmeshed? Within one year, I had 12,000 views. Just stunning to me. And then I had done another video about a message for partners of enmeshed men. I had 6,000, over 6,000 uh, views on that. And it told me something. It told me that the partners were probably driving the men into the treatment. And, and indeed, that seems to be the case. Most of the men coming into my workshops are nudged in, booted in, encouraged in, supported in. It's either me or your mother. <laughs> Make up your mind, buddy. And uh, of course, it's not that easy for the man, right? He's been burdened for many, many years out of loyalty. And so one of the things we see is more men seeking assistance because the women, heterosexual in this case, although these dynamics cut across gender and orientation. So most of my examples will be heterosexual males with female partners, and you'll forgive me if that doesn't fit your story, but I can tell you I've had gay men in there and uh, we've had to mesh women in our workshop, although they're harder to bring in because women tend to be culturally reinforced to take care of their parents. They don't see it as a problem. And the men in their lives are not pushing them into treatment. Whereas the other way around, we see women pushing the men into treatment. So it's been harder to bring women into the, uh, the recovery from enmeshment. I probably have had 250 requests from women in the last three years. And out of that group, I've gotten six into a workshop. I want you to think about that. I think women don't spend money on themselves. They give it to their man. They feel culturally reinforced to take care of their parents. And they don't always see it as the same problem as the men do. Um, I've had probably 800 men, easy, maybe 1,000 men contact me. Out of that, I've had 450 come in. So this gives you some feeling about why it's so difficult to bring the women in and why I have more discussion coming from the men. But just assume that in general, these dynamics cut across gender and orientation. When I've had gay men in the workshops, very little differences with the heterosexual men. Um, so what are some of the characteristics of an enmeshed family system? Strong demands for loyalty, those demands for and, and, a, and a shared reality of the family system roles and the obligations of those roles imposed by the people in charge, usually not you, <laughs> usually one of your parents who are either narcissistic, dependent, have their own issues, are undifferentiated themselves. In other words, they're not emancipated from their families. And so they tend to repeat that in their systems and they they view you as an extension of themselves, and therefore, if I'm lonely, you take care of me. That's not the job of a parent. Right? The job of the parent is to is to, at those critical life cycle issues, like when they go off to college. My son recently went off to college, and I've had to learn to uh, stay quiet, <laughs> often when I'm missing him, and he, he was my playing catch buddy. And so his, his, uh, his interests are not, not the same anymore. <laughs> And hands-on parenting is not happening. We had a nice relationship, and we still do, but it's changing. And one of the one of the um, 
um, ironic observations that family system therapists make is the more the parents let go, the more desirous the adult children want to return. So the irony is, is providing space invites closeness. Holding on, making somebody feel guilty, punishing, retaliation, because you're not doing what I want and you're not staying next to me, never mind your marriage, never mind your recovery, your loyalty is to me, I need you to take care of me, I'm lonely, I can't deal with your father anymore. That adult child doesn't want to return. They may return out of obligation. So that's where the essence of these MS systems are, is that they're obligatory, they're accompanied by guilt, time together is maximized, uh, people on the outside are seen as sometimes um, intrusive so we'll get i i can't tell you the number of uh, stories i hear that sometimes just just uh, uh, floor me where the parent will overtly criticize the spouse and try to undermine the relationship with the marriage and and so i had one man just this year in one of the workshops say my mother told me get on with that divorce so you and i can be together and I, I was, you know, as many times as I've heard this kind of stuff, I'm still stunned at some of the overtness. Now, sometimes these uh, messages of don't leave me, I need you to take care of me and don't go too far are more implicit, not always so obvious. They're more, they're more built into the system. And sometimes your brothers and sisters will become agents, right? Your mother or father will solicit your brothers and sisters to track you down and remind you, hey, you better call mom, right? So we have to teach people to say, you know what? If mom wants to talk to me, she can call me herself. If you and I want to get together for a cup of coffee, let's do that. So that's called having a boundary in an MS system, which you really need to have um, in order to start this emancipation process. And those, and those spouses or partners who are romantically involved with an enmeshed man or woman are almost always second fiddle. They almost always don't rise to the level of feeling as if they're the most important person in the life of that enmeshed man because his, his obligations are to the mother or to the family. And so she winds up making adjustments that cause grievances, resentments, and problems. Um, what so now that we're sort of on the topic of dysfunctional families and enmeshed families, let's talk about what are the characteristics of a healthy family. So, if you again, if you go into the family system, family systems is a form of therapy, right? So, when I was in graduate school, some of my training was in family systems, I worked with kids early on. So you had to learn the dynamics. So we saw kids, for example, who had psychosomatic disorders that were a result of the parents' dysfunction. And it sort of trickled down into, into how the body reacted and high stress levels. And so we had to learn to work with the family system. So there's a whole group of therapists and clinicians who study um, uh, symptom uh, or issues, say addictions, from a family system point of view. So if you go into that literature, here's what you find for the bullet points of a healthy family. One, the parents are well differentiated. They're their own man or woman. They're not their, they're not their father and mother, sons or daughters anymore. They're their own man or woman. There's clear generational boundaries. I had a guy who I worked with and did some consulting with, and he, when he wanted to talk to his mother, which he couldn't stand doing, he would be in, he would do the call in the car. And he'd have his adolescent daughters in there, 12, 13 year old girls, young, young women, becoming young women. They want, their, they want to listen to the music. They don't want to talk to their grandmother, who's very narcissistic and demanding. And so he would call his mother and then put his daughters on so they would run interference. I said, you have to stop doing that. It is not your daughter's job to run interference for you. Furthermore, you are teaching them to declare loyalty in the face of not wanting to, you're setting them up to be involved in, in relationships down the road in which they don't have a choice. You've got to stop that. It's your job to speak to your mother. And if you can't do that, it is not your daughter's job to run interference for you. It's one of the hallmarks of an MS system is this sort of triangulated loyalty uh, communication styles. You know, you got your brother or sister calling you, telling you that mom's upset with you. 
well, why is mom not calling me, right? So um, in, in healthy families, clear generational boundaries, parents are differentiated. The loyalty is to the family of procreation, meaning the, the romance you have, the children you have, the career you have, and it is greater than the family of origin. So again, you go into the literature, these are the characteristics of healthy systems, systems that function well and they generate independent, um, autonomous adults who get productive in the world, both romantically and otherwise, and tend to have a minimum of problems like addictions. That doesn't mean they can't get into that because there's other reasons people get into addictions, of course. Spouses put themselves before anyone else, meaning the spouses are primary to each other. Not the kids, not the dog, well, sometimes the dog. But <laughs> my, my dog is very cute, so sometimes he gets top, top shelf, right? Uh, every once in a while, if we're paying too much attention to the dog, my wife and I will complain. You're paying more attention to the dog than you are me. And so, um, all jokes aside, a healthy system in general, uh, on a, and these are all in general good enough most of the time statements, the spouses are primary, not mother, not father, not sister, not brother, not your addictions, not your affair partner, it's your, it's your spouse. Again, one of the traits of a healthy system. Each, another, another trait of a healthy system, it, is, it encourages the identity, development, and autonomy of each family member. You don't owe me anything. You owe, you owe yourself an opportunity to become who you are. So not everybody has to be a football player. You get to be an artist. And not everybody has to do what I think you should do. Of course, sometimes I think my son should do what, what I want him to do. But that's, that ship has sailed, right? He, he reminds me that's not going to be happening. He's got his own journey. And, and as I step back, of course, I celebrate that. That's, I want nothing more for my son but for him to find his place in the world. The other characteristic of a healthy system, non-possessive warmth and affection, meaning I love you because I love you, not because you owe me. open, clear communication, and open to outsiders. So I'm having a little trouble with my son's girlfriend's family. We have some differences. And I think to myself, when I start getting on my high horse, you know, it's a good thing that he has other people coming into his life. He's his own person, he'll find his way. And it's a good thing that we get to meet these people, right? We get to have an extended family, if you will. So a mesh system, shut that down. And they find reasons to create distance because you differ from me politically or whatever it is that you happen to do. So this, these are the traits of a healthy system, folks. Anything short of this is trouble. I have to be honest with you. And if you look at a measurement, boy, you can see where the problem comes in. So, so many of you may be asking at the moment, so where is the line between caring and a measurement or cultural norms and enmeshment, meaning I come from a culture uh, where closeness and interdependency, so first generation in this country often have a sort of, uh, my mother was first generation Hungarian, so you often see in first generations almost always a sort of circling the wagons phenomena, some interdependency as people land in the culture and they find their way out of their original culture and in, 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 uh, hopefully um, assimilate into the larger culture. So initially you have these interdependencies in these first generation systems, which tend to be very warm. The trouble is, <clears throat> is, that, is that people struggle to know where the line is and there's all this pull to have you stay loyal to the system at a cost to your own independence. And certainly if you come into this country, getting independent is part of the economic and, and the uh, philosophy of, of the, de the democracy that we live in, right? You've got to get your own sea legs if you're going to make it. It's just the nature of the beast here, right? And we, that's a side discussion, but that's that's the culture we live in here. So it's really a circular argument. How do I know where the line is between caring and enmeshment if I've never felt free to say no? If I can't say no, I'm not obligated to you, then I don't know where the line is. Everything becomes a compromise. Okay, I'm celebrating my anniversary this weekend. And you know what? My mom's called me. And she's having a hard time with my dad. He's really being a jerk and she's feeling upset. She wants me to come over and cut the grass. And I know my wife's going to be upset if we don't celebrate our anniversary. But you know what? 
I'm going to, I'm going to just ask her to wait till next weekend. I'll take her to her favorite restaurant. Well, so the, the wife having, having had this experience many times sort of has resigned herself, not happily, of course, and she has her resentments and her grievances. And so he chooses his mother trying to placate everybody. It's called the, we call it a troublesome compromise in the uh, workshop. We have these uh, enmeshed men list their troublesome compromises. They're always trouble. Nobody's happy, especially the enmeshed adult. So in order to say, I want to come to you out of caring, I choose to come to you. First, you have to declare territory. This is my space. You don't get in. And I don't reach out just out of obligation. So you need a no before you can have a true yes. People in enmeshed systems and who are particularly enmeshed with a parent virtually have never had a no. And that's not overstating it. So the argument's circular. There is no way to know the line until you learn to say no and have your own space and say, I'm sorry you're having a hard time with dad, but that's your business. It's not my business. Your problems are not my problems. Your loneliness is not my loneliness, right? So that's a recovery tool, a recovery skill that you have to learn to do internally and externally sometimes in order to have this separation and emancipation. And then once you do, you're much free to say, you know, I'm sorry you're having a hard time. If you need a grass cut, I'll hire somebody for you. I'll still help out, but I'll help out on my terms. I'll still care about you, but I'll care about you on my terms. I have now divorced myself from the contractual arrangements that I should obligate my life to you and submit my journey to you, only to discover that I've lost two generations of my life to trying to fix you, which hasn't worked, by the way, right? And of course, it never works because it's not my job, right? Um, <clears throat> So when, when is this relationship with the parent uh, too close? What are some of the hallmarks of that too close? When the relationship primarily serves the emotional needs of the parent, it's trouble. Not supposed to be that way. It doesn't mean you don't love your parents. You don't come to their assistance sometimes. Nobody's throwing the baby. When that separation and emancipation is not amputation. Now, sometimes... For so some folks, the more toxic and retaliatory the parent, sometimes the boundaries are rigid. I don't talk to them for a year, you know, and that's a personal decision. So I get asked all the time, and some of you may ask me, and I won't answer for you because I shouldn't be answering this question for you. I get guys in the workshop, should I talk to my mother? Should I see my mother? Should I cut off my family for a year? I, I don't know. What I want to help you do is establish your independence and autonomy, declare your own space as yours, and then from that space, you can make your own decision, right? Free of obligation, free of guilt, free of addiction, right? That space now is a freedom for you. That answer will come to you. You don't need me to answer that for you. So one of the questions that Tammy will screen out is anybody who asks me, should they not see or talk to their parents. I won't answer that for you. You've got to come to terms with that. But I will say to you, find your own space, find your own territory, free of obligatory loyalties that were never yours to begin with. Um, when the child is too close to a parent and in a tug of war, so if the parent, if the kid's stuck in the marital bond, so those of you, who, so through no fault of theirs if you only have one child so we had one child they're invariably in the middle of the marriage and they just feel every nuance right <clears throat> uh, that goes on in the marriage so sometimes though the kid becomes a pawn and one of the parents demands loyalty from the child um in in um in the uh tug of war you know i remember well, years ago so we, we we made sure my wife and i made sure my son got a good set of boundaries and knew that he, our problems were not his problems. And you know, every once in a while, my wife and I would slip and complain about each other in front of him, you know? And, and so <laughs> she told me a story where he was in the car with her and she made some mention of, of um, one of my shortcomings, which are, are less than they used to be, thank goodness. Um, and he said, he turned to her and goes, it's not my problem, don't talk to me about it, talk to dad. <laughs> well, he's about 12 years old, you know? And I thought, well, good for him. 
you know, but, but, but I, of course, I didn't want to hear about the problem, but, but she brought it up anyways. So, so that's a boundary, right? And these, these men and women who come from mesh systems, they can't say that. And sometimes their journeys in recovery depend on it. So I know I'm going to go home this. So let's, let's look at a recovering addict. We'll talk about that in a minute, about how enmeshment links to addiction. So I'm a recovering, let's say I'm a recovering sex addict, recovering drug or alcoholic. And I know that I walk into my family and I'm, I'm about five years old emotionally all over again. And I want my father's attention or I have to take care of my mother as she complains about my father and I don't want to do it. And I, I, I regress, but I don't feel free to say, you know, when I come visit you for the holidays, this is back, back when we could travel more freely. Uh, I'm not staying with you. I'm staying in a hotel down the street because I need my space. So what happens to the addict, alcoholic, sex addict who visits his family and he regresses to be age five, caught in the loyalty binds? There's a very good chance he relapses the next week. Failed to take care of himself. Failed to do what Bill Wilson said, right? The humility was becoming who we are rather than who we thought we should be. I have limits as an addict. I can't keep chasing my father's approval. I can't keep listening to my mother and stay sober. I have to face that. That's what the program teaches us, right? So at some point, the boundaries have to be set. Any more visits to my parents are in a hotel room. And they go from five days to two days, right? Because I know after 48 hours, everybody gets into this stuff. I, I call it the Adam's 48 hour rule. So after about 48 hours, you watch this with your family if you visit from long distances. Everybody seems can keep their cool for about 48 hours, but then afterwards, the political discussions, whatever you're going to do, are going to start start happening. Um, <clears throat> so what are some of the common problems of a, of a man or woman enmeshed with a the parent? They're overly bonded to the family of origin. They're ambivalent around commitment. So one of the biggest issues is I can't make up my mind whether I love you or want to be with you. I thought I did, but I'm not so sure now. We get lots of ambivalence. And what happens is, is that that original relationship with mom or dad in which I felt stuck, obligated, burdened, I transfer all those feelings into my new romance. So I don't really leave them behind. I could live across the country from my parents. My mother could be dead, but I still carry inside of me the template, the feelings. And so now I, I find somebody I fall in love with, but about a year into it, they want further commitment and oh, you feel smothering to me. You're trying to control me. And she's going, what are you talking about? I just want to get married and have kids and have a life. What do, what, do, what do you mean I'm smothering you, right? And so now you begin to project or displace onto your partner feelings that don't belong there. And so we get this relationship ambivalence, one foot in, one foot out. Probably the biggest problem with uh, people who come in for measurement work excessive caretaking, self-neglect, addictions, sexual issues. So either they're shut down because they, they never quite get their own oomph, their own passionate involvement. So sexuality sort of fades because I've lost my passion or I'm compulsive and addictive, always trying to escape the bind and prove that I'm not neutered or, or trapped anymore, right? So sexual addiction becomes a compensatory I got to prove myself in reaction to this, this, this uh, disempowering relationship where I can't be myself. So I'll show you, I'll go act out in secret or I'll go eat. So eating and sexual acting out are primary addictive issues coming out of enmeshment, but not limited to that, but primary. I'll eat what I want. You won't tell me how to eat and I'll, I'll be secretive of my sexuality. Uh, the trouble is, is that meshed men and women might marry somebody and they can't betray the, the parent. In other words, they can't reject the parent, so they wind up betraying the spouse. Wrong person, folks, wrong woman, wrong man to be betraying. So um, so this, this obligatory loyalty gives rise to addictive issues. Addictions feel, I'm in control, I'm free. You can't tell me what to do. So again, Bill Wilson talked about that, his early 
uh, writings uh, that he felt, I, I'm going to get this not quite right, but essentially what he said is that the alcoholics coming into the program were stuck in adolescence. They were all rebellious. And that was true. In many ways, the development sort of stopped when they began drinking. Right. And so they never quite resolved that rebellious moratorium questioning. I got to do my own thing, uh, period. They got stuck there. And the addiction sort of locked them, froze them in that developmental space. And recovery helps you unthaw that you become who you are. You begin to grow up. Right. And so in, in, in one of the things that and so in the mesh systems, part of that disruption of identity development is I feel I never get to be myself. I never get a voice. I don't know what restaurant I want to go to. I thought I loved you, but I don't I don't know if I want to have a marriage or a family. I don't, I don't know what I want. Right. So I'm lost to myself because my mother has dominated me, told me how to think and feel and told me I should feel guilty. So my sense of self never quite emerges. I never have a full, healthy rebellion a moratorium is what we call it in the clinical field, right? Questioning period. So stepping out, you know, rejecting your parents' values, although maybe coming back often to embracing many of them. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the addiction is, okay, I can be free. I can look at porn. I can use drugs. I can, I can hang around people who are rebellious too. I can overeat. You can't tell me what to eat. So all of a sudden addictions become intertwined with that rebellious need for freedom. Hence, if I go visit my family and I regress back to being eight and taking care of my mother, boom, I could have 12 good months of sobriety in the AA, the SAA program, and like somebody flipped a switch. That's because the inner workings of that identity issue of who I am never has been caught up with because I keep, I keep finding myself obligated in this role of enmeshment and identity to the family. So re from that standpoint, recovery from addiction requires more than just stopping a behavior. It requires the development of a cohesive sense of myself. I am who I am. I say what I mean and I mean what I say. I say yes when I want to say yes and I say no when I want to say no. And if I need to say maybe, I will get back to you. And I don't feel guilty about it. It's my birthright to have those those clarity of purpose in my in my journey. So ultimately, recovery moves from stopping the behavior, recovering from trauma and into the development of a full embodied sense of self. And, and clearly, when you look at people who are enmeshed, that's the number one priority. You've got to help them get their sea legs and find out who they are. Um, and they have to learn to set boundaries. They have to, I see we're getting close to our 20 minute mark and I'm going to, I'm getting close to the end. So that's good. Um, and so they have to learn to set boundaries, identify when they're beginning to feel guilty and pity for their parent and say, wait a minute, why, why am I feeling pity? I have, a, I have an interview with one of the men who came to the workshop that he's allowed me to use for clinical purposes and training. And his mother was notoriously um, interested in, in his uh, sexual uh, journey and his romantic journey. And she'd always question him. And so he kept destroying romances because he'd always feel obligated to his mother. Right. And so finally he said, wait a minute, why am I feeling guilty? I can divorce my mother. I'm supposed to. I'm supposed to be able to have my own life, my own romance. So uh, wonderfully, he and his first wife are getting back together again. So it'll be a nice story. And um, so when he talks to his mother, he didn't amputate her. He just doesn't respond. She asks about who he's dating. He doesn't tell her. He keeps privacy. This is my space. You don't get in without my permission. Now, for some of you, that might sound a little rigid. But the truth of the matter is, if that space of yours has always been collapsed and you've always been forced to submit of obligation loyalty, you must find some space. And it's in that space of your recovering self where you're true to yourself, hence that phrase in the recovery program, 
that you will find your answers. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us because we will have an inner voice that says, uh-uh, don't do them, man. Or no, go here. No, don't don't get married. I, I call it my first marriage. I didn't listen to my inner voice. My, my brother said to me the night before the marriage, you know what you're doing? I said, sure, I know what I'm doing. In the meantime, I got this voice in me getting married because she wanted to get married because I passed on my enmeshment, right? I didn't know what I wanted. She wanted to, so therefore I must want to, right? Well, that lasted about a year. So um, I'm going to read to you uh, in closing before we go to questions here, and I'll give you um, I'll give you an exercise that you can do uh, afterwards uh, together with your spouse or or with yourself. Uh, although interestingly enough, you know, um, so we have these these men who are coming into the workshop for enmeshment, and we can't we can't do it right now at the retreat center because of COVID. So we have it on Zoom. So when we had at the retreat center, we had an opportunity to have them cocoon, sort of get free of all their dependencies. And so now we have guys who are interacting with their spouse and family at home. Some guys stay in hotels and some guys stay in Airbnbs and they do the workshop. And so the issue comes up, should I tell my spouse what's going on? And I say, no, no, your job this weekend is to break all dependencies. You're not keeping secrets, you're creating privacy. After you've had some period of time of privacy, if you wanna share, by all means, share what feels right for you and your relationship. But it's so, it's so amazing to me that the first place these men go is they feel they have to take their journey and give it to somebody else right away. Now, that gets a little complicated when you're talking about partners of sex addicts, right? Because, and I'll mention this briefly, and then we'll get on to questions. But of course, one of the pieces of the recovery process, if you're a partner of a sex addict and you have felt traumatized by the betrayal, and of course you have, by the sexual betrayal and the betrayal of trust, is there has to be a period of transparency, right? And disclosure. And so that's important and and that becomes a little more complicated if you're recovering sex addict is also enmeshed right because he views the need for transparency as control and if your need for transparency does indeed turn into the demand for submission you will feel like his mother to him and so there's a lot of nuances in that dynamic that you folks have to sort out carefully with your therapists with your sponsors when you have sex addiction, partner trauma, and enmeshment in the sex addict. It's more complicated. It's not so straightforward. So I'll read to you uh, this uh, brief um, quote, and then we'll, we'll end and we'll, we'll turn over for questions. So this came from a man from 2014, one of the first workshops I did. And this, this came from um, uh, the exercise, trusting your inner voice. So there's a series of exercises or touchstones that we work with in the, in the workshop. And so knowing full well that most of the individuals coming into the workshop have no clue what their inner voice is, we, we kind of dig in and get down the rabbit hole of that issue. Here's what he wrote, and you could have heard a pin drop in the room. See, this exercise makes me angry because there are distinct times I should have listened to my inner voice that's been my behavior, my default for so long that it has become ingrained. This is the well-worn path that cost the consequences is that I'm not living the life I've chosen. I'm living the life I allow to be formed around me. Stunning. I'm living the life I allow to be formed around me. It's not mine. It's everybody else's, man. That's trouble for a recovering person. That's a relapse issue. And I, he goes on, I sit in despair and agony at times when I consider the potential I had, when I dared to imagine what my life would look like if I had been true to myself and listened to my inner voice. He had tears in his eyes, the whole place went silent. He lived next door to his mother, with his wife, and his wife wanted nothing to do with that arrangement. I'm living the life I allow to be formed around me. So my wish for all of you is you live the life that you choose, not the one you allow to be formed around you. So I will step out now of 
the lecture and see if there's some questions that uh, Tammy has put together uh, that I could address. Yes, so we do have some questions. Uh, thank you, thank you, it's so good. I've got so much I'm spinning through my head too. So the first question is, I'm a gay male with chem sex addiction. After a near-death experience with meth, I called my retired parents overseas and disclosed my addictions. They dropped everything and came to the US to love and, um, uh, to love to, oh, to live with me for five months. Is this cultural or is this enmeshment? Good. If they helped you out, great. But if you're stuck being their son and not your own man, it's going to be a problem. So um, if, if there's a history of enmeshment, then you're going to have to disentangle again. If there's not, your parents will know when it's time to leave and to send you on your own. So you, you've got to get your sea legs, right? So it depends. I mean, if if that trans so you, so what you, you see enmeshment flare up in life cycle transitional spaces uh marriages kids leaving home uh young people moving into their adulthood uh, parents family helping out during difficult times with recovery but when it's time to move out of that dependency state because you're in a dependent state great you need it to be fine so i wouldn't judge that but if that transitional space gets blocked down with obligation to them now, or they feel like they've made inroads and they don't want to let go, now you have enmeshment problems. So I would look at the transitional space as opposed to the space that assisted you as you got your, yourself on your feet. So the next question is, is emotional enmeshment like emotional incest? Yes. So dif different labels to describe this, folks. Enmeshment, I use the word covert incest. Uh, Pat Love, my colleague, uh, used the phrase um, emotional incest. I use covert incest. And when you use the word incest without physical sexual violation, what you're talking about with the emotional covert incest is that is that relationship with the parent has turned more into a surrogate husband, surrogate wife, sexualized boyfriend or girlfriend role that begins to feel icky. Oh, this is too close, man. I'm not your boyfriend. I'm not your husband. Go get your own boyfriend or husband. So now we've kind of crossed the line from general enmeshment, I'm obligated out of loyalty, caretaking, to a more defined role that feels like it crosses boundaries that are icky. So you can get an, an incestuous crossing of boundaries that feels icky without any sexual physical touch. And it will it will impact your sexual development and sexual addiction is a is a common outcome of that crossing. So the next question is, um, I want to know if Dr. Adams has any insight into how a mother enmeshment can separate or identify request commitment or behaviors such as sending messages throughout the day in their partner that trigger feelings felt from the result of enmeshment. So I think if I hear that right that the, the partners wishing for contact on a frequent basis throughout the day feels like the enmeshing mother. Did that's I hear that what right? I'm, yeah, that's, okay. yeah, it's triggering yeah. feelings, yes. So that's, that's a little more complicated, but, but an excellent question. And you, you have to honor the fact that while they're not your mother and you don't want to reject them or you're not looking to emancipate from your partner like you are with your mother. You may need a little differentiation and separation. You know, sweetie, I love con connecting with you, but I can't do it all day long. I, I lose track of myself. Can we, can we connect in a different way? You're going to have to negotiate. So enmeshment recovery in the relationship is negotiating the space in, in, a, in open communication, honoring the fact that you don't like the frequency, and you don't have to make your partner bad for one infrequent contact. You have to negotiate the contractual arrangement so both of you feel like you have a voice in that contract. Now, the parent, when you're separating from the parent, they don't get a voice, folks. Let me make that very clear with you. Emancipation from a parent does not require their co-assignment or their co-signature to your declaration of independence. Emancipation is not a negotiation with the parent. Working through my enmeshment issues with my spouse isn't more of a negotiation. I don't need my parent's approval to move on with my life. There's a difference. 
that's hard for people. <laughs> um, hard for men and women who have these entangled relationships to really, when they hear me say that, they don't, they don't like what, they don't like it. And they feel very challenged by that. But I tell you, there's no, there's no, there's no second option there for you. Emancipation, I mean, if you're having trouble, that usually means the system, the parents are not honoring your separation. Many parents will catch up with it. First, they'll resign themselves. Better keep my mouth shut, otherwise he won't want to come around me at all, right? Usually we hope for at least that. Eventually, those who collect themselves do some more accepting and there can be some healing. Adult to adult relationships now. Um, sometimes that's not always possible. And you have to hold your ground, visit your family on your terms. And I'm sorry you're having trouble, mom, dad. Um, and you say to yourself, not my problem. I love you. Here's a big hug. I'll see you next holiday. Next question. How do we help the SA develop a sense of self? What are the steps to do this? How does this affect the family spouse during the SA's recovery period? All great questions. So let's start with how do we, how can, and I don't know if we can help people develop a sense of self. I, I mean, what mm -hmm. are your thoughts? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Well, I think, I think the program, if practiced, um, it does help you unfold your true self, right? It, it, it is, there's built into the system that your recovery is your priority and I'm not going down this road again. And so I become willing, I, I have to make some changes about how I see myself and how I see the world. And so by putting recovery first, it kind of reorients your internal view of how you're going to navigate in the world. And so, you know what, I got to think about that. If you want to borrow another $10,000 from me that you didn't pay back last time, I'll get back to you on that, you know? So sometimes this development of the self is a one day at a time phenomena, just like the letting go of an addiction, right? You have to identify the ways you collapse yourself and you have to learn to set boundaries. So sometimes I'll get back with you as your best boundary. And then you get support for your position uh, from safe people, not from your brothers or sisters, who, who probably aren't going to necessarily see your point of view, right? Because they're enmeshed with your family. So it's a, it's a one day at a time phenomena of doing for us what we can never do for ourselves, that program promise, right? Where I'm free of addiction, I'm in my feelings, I'm in my body, I'm doing this business one day at a time, I'm checking into myself, the, the program really is, in some ways, the self-development medicine for recovering people. I think with enmeshment, you need a more specific um, profile of, of um, skills and toolbox, tool, toolbox uh, tools in your toolbox to deal with it. Uh, boundaries, saying yes when you mean yes, no when you mean no, mean what you say, say what you mean. I put that in your back pocket right now. So, and, and I think this is a really helpful question too. What does it, what does that affect the family? Um, you know, how does someone learning to have this autonomy? How does someone learning to have this these boundaries? How is that going to play out within a family or a spousal relationship? So, with the family, it'll affect the system. So, when you've changed, the system will either lock down and get more rigid and more retaliatory. Because what will happen is, if you're if, say you're a surrogate husband caretaker to your mother, you're a man, you pull out and you stop doing it, she, her complaints and her agitation raise, so she starts moving to your younger brother. She, she pulls him in, he's angry with you, so he calls you and says, why didn't you call mom? Because I don't want to deal with her. So the system shifts. And oftentimes, it's not just separating from a parent, you have to separate from the whole system. Because if the system doesn't change and say, you know, mom, maybe your mother says, well, you know, I better go into therapy. I better go and do some counseling because uh, something went off here. I don't want to lose my son and I want to be respectful to him. Okay, now hopefully your change process influences some positive healing. That isn't usually the case, at least the people I see because everybody coming in 
to my workshops and my practice are pretty come from these pretty troubled systems and the way it'll affect the marriage or, or partnership is that as the partner sees the enmeshed man begin to separate she'll feel more as a priority and she'll she'll feel more of his presence and uh and so that'll be a welcome relief to her he'll be more in control more adult more empowered now the downside for her is that he isn't always going to uh, do the step with her that she'd been used to demanding from him and he's going to have her his own positions so her job will be to welcome this relief but also respectfully say thank god i don't like that he doesn't want to do what i want to do but thank god he's his own man because that's what i really need so it forces her to grow in her own self-identity as well under best conditions next question what is the difference between keeping secret and privacy and how does an um, how does enmeshment within the spouse look like? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I think that secrecy we, we might safely describe as anything that is held back that clearly is detrimental to the relationship that the partner has a right to know versus privacy is that, you know, this workshop was really what I wanted to do. It was a good experience and I want to be here with you and share with you um, the good energy, but I think I'm going to keep private um, all the details. It's learning to hold the self in your own space and not give it away so quickly. Maybe down the road you might share an insight or something, but but so that's not secrecy. I'm entitled to my experience. I don't have to tell you what I do in my therapy. Now that crosses a little bit of a of a no man's land when this early stages of partner trauma recovery legitimately needs some transparency and more detail. And so the recovering MS man will have some, some decisions to make. And can he share without feeling as if he's submitting? And she, and he, she will have to say, do I really need to know this? Or can I give him his privacy? Is there something in that that I definitely need to know that feels secret? So it's again a nuanced sorting out process. So the Your next therapist, oh, go ahead. And I would look for a therapist who are able to help you with the nuances here. If you get a therapist who rigidly locks into these models and, and doesn't isn't able to flex its trouble. Next question is, I'm interested in resources from you to learn more about healing from enmeshment. So uh, we mentioned earlier, some of you joined us a little bit later, but on overcomingenmeshment.com, which is listed in the slides, if you download the slides that are at the top of the screen, you'll see that website. And Dr. Adams does do uh, weekend workshops for people, even during COVID, he's been uh, continuing to do this work. So you will find resources. He's also training other therapists um, to be more skilled in identifying this and working with that. So I would invite you to go to that. He's written several books. I've got Silently Seduced Handy, but Overcome or uh, When He's Married to Mom is another very popular one. So I would invite you to check that out. And he mentioned his YouTube channel. I'm sure you will find the uh, information on that very useful too. So. <clears throat> Next question, can one become enmeshed when his parents neglected, rejected, and abandoned him emotionally? Not typically, not typically. Um, so, you know, enmeshment really, the, 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 the linchpin of the definition is this over-involvement out of obligatory guilt. Now they can become very dependent in later relationships and because of their abandonment, not really have a self so there's some crossover of some of these issues that we're talking about with other sources of trauma neglect abuse and abandonment can get you to some of these symptoms too but but now enmeshment really is this over involvement obligatory loyalties and guilt to the parent so next question is it advisable to tell mom she is the source of your enmeshment so again i can't answer that for you at all and, I, and you shouldn't ask me because <laughs> there's pros and cons. <clears throat> you do not need your mother's approval, validation, or um, acknowledgement that there's a problem. Your emancipation does not hinge on her response. 
Whether you should have a conversation with her is really something for you to sort out. Once you, once you have a greater sense of your own personal space and you can feel settled, do I really need to say something to her? Okay, maybe, but why? What's the purpose here? So one of the things we do in our workshop is we have the men write these letters that they don't send. We, they actually burn them. Although that's gotten interesting during, during Zoom. We had one guy get a blowtorch and light up uh, in his, he was staying in his office over the weekend and, and he had a metal container and he had a blowtorch. He burned the letter and the fire department came in the middle oh, of our wow. <laughs> so I said no more. I said you're gonna you're gonna have the story of, of forever of the what not to do. So we have them write these divorce letters of divorcing contractual arrangements with their parent. But you don't send them. We don't encourage you to confront your parent. The confrontation is not necessary. The confrontation is with yourself. It's the internal dialogue that really requires you to say, "Don't do it, Ken." You don't, don't spend your energy trying to convince your mother she caused you problems. Move on with your life, man, right? So really the confrontation tends to be more internal. There are circumstances where you do need to clear the air, confront, but I, I couldn't tell you about your situation. We and are out of, oh yeah, we are out of time. This has been so, so enlightening, so helpful. So for those of you, I, the link, um, uh, if you missed the first part of it or just want to hear it again, will be placed hopefully by the end of the week on intherooms.com forward slash home forward slash super dash Saturday dash recovery dash summit. That's where all of the other ones from the previous are uh, as well. So, and they have affirmed that they will be able to put the PowerPoints up as well. There was a lot of information that Dr. Adams was not able to go through, including that exercise. So um, do click on the link and download those if you are able to. So um, thank you again, my friend. Um, go to overcomingenmeshment.com, uh, learn more. Uh, thanks to all of you. Deborah Kaplan will be on with a great topic in an hour. So we'll see you then. Thanks, everybody. Bye.